Welcome to this service in and from St Nicholas Buclou Parish Church. Today in our service we will be hearing two readings, one about the prophet Elijah being taken up into heaven, and the other the story, as Mark tells it, of the transfiguration of Jesus. I think these stories invite us to think about some big issues in our lives. Things like parting and succession, about what we receive and about what we may pass on. And I think they help us to think about our attitude to the past and our attitude towards the future. And as we hear them this morning, I think we should try to remember that Christian people, by our faith, must be people of hope, not regret, and that our faith means we ought to be looking forward much more than we look back. So let us worship God. We sing our first hymn number 355, You, Lord, are both Lamb and Shepherd. Let us pray. We stand in awe, for the, for the Lord our God is the Holy One. We hide our faces and are afraid, afraid that we cannot stand in the presence of your goodness, afraid of the sin that is within us. You are our Lord and King. 
Humbly we seek to proclaim your greatness and to worship you, longing that our worship may bring us closer to the source of all light. Holy God, present in our midst, yet beyond all comprehension, by your light we see light. By your healing we are made whole. By your mercy, we know your greatness. Turn your gaze upon our weakness and show us the way of your love, that we may live with unveiled faces as people with nothing to hide. Merciful and gracious God, we bow before your unending compassion, the measure of our falling short. We have not loved as you command. We have not always spoken truly. We have not cared for creation, including ourselves, according to your will. What we intend, we have not pursued. What we mean to avoid, we embrace. Help us to know the mind of Christ, that in all thoughts, words and deeds, our lives might come to honour you. God of light and truth, Open our eyes to the glory of your presence in the world around us, but chiefly in the face of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that we may grow into his likeness and attain the happy fulfilment of our hope when the splendour of the Saviour will be revealed. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As Jack comes forward to read our readings this morning, I should explain that they are taken at his special request from the authorised version of 1611. And for reasons best known to the early 17th century translators, in the reading from the second book of Kings, which we'll hear first, the prophet is called Elijah, but in the reading from Mark's gospel, his name is rendered Elias. They do, in fact, refer to the same person. The first reading is from the second book of Kings, chapter 2. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. 
And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And the second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into an high mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses, one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Thanks be to God.
in the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Two young lovers, Romeo and Juliet, late at night must part from one another. Their families are deadly enemies, yet they are so in love. Discovery would be catastrophic, so part they must, but in parting they look forward to the morning when they can meet again. That anticipation sweetens the sorrow of their parting. This morning's Bible readings are concerned with parting. The story of Elisha and Elijah, obviously so, because it ends with Elijah being carried off into heaven. But the story of the transfiguration is also tinged with the anticipation of parting. Though the disciples involved perhaps do not realise it. The story of the transfiguration is the beginning of the story of Jesus' passion, the story of his suffering, death, resurrection, and ultimately his ascension. And that's why we read it each year on this Sunday, the Sunday before the season of Lent begins. But let's begin with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, one of the greatest of the prophets, a man who has gone through so much, suffered so much, yet always remained faithful and fearless in his proclamation of the word of God, sensed that his time on earth was coming to an end. He sets out on what he knows will be his last journey. He's accompanied by his pupil, his young disciple, his friend, Elisha. Elijah knows that the journey will be hard, harder even for Elisha than it is for Elijah. They are at Gilgal, and Elijah says, the Lord is sending him to Bethel. So stay here, he tells Elisha. But Elisha refuses to leave Elijah. As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. They arrive at Bethel. The prophets in Bethel come to Elisha and say, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? They're saying, don't put yourself through this. But Elisha responds, yes, I know. Keep silent. I need to say, stay strong. Don't tempt me to take the easy way out. The same happens at Jericho and then at the Jordan. Elisha will not leave Elijah no matter who encourages him to do so. He must see this through. It is the struggle of his life. He tells the prophets who are, I think, trying to care for him to be silent because he knows that he is at breaking point and could falter in his resolve. But he doesn't. He stays with Elijah. 
He stays with them as Elijah strikes the Jordan with his mantle, parts the waters, and they cross the river on dry land. He stays with him right up until the moment that the old prophet is taken up into heaven and the mantle of prophecy symbolically falls on Elisha. The places through which they pass are significant. It is as if they are reversing the route taken by the Israelites when under the leadership of Joshua they entered the promised land. The rolling up of the, the mantle, the cloak, and the striking of the waters remind us of Moses parting the Red Sea. This journey is an indictment of the faithlessness of Israel. The great prophet symbolically leaving the land and the people. It is also a final test for Elisha. Does he have the strength to become a leading prophet? Can he handle the pressure, the responsibility, the unpopularity which will come his way as he takes up the work that Elijah is laying down? Just before the moment of final parting, he asks for something huge. He asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, of what it was which enabled and sustained Elijah's life and faith and work. As Elijah's mantle falls, he receives it. Elijah has left, but Elisha must return, retracing the route into the promised land. God's work must go on. Elisha has shown himself to be stoical. Yes, I know. Keep silent. He has shown himself to be faithful as the Lord lives. I will not leave you. He is ready to be as great, maybe greater even, than Elijah. This is a challenge to our usual way of thinking. Especially in churches, we tend to be deeply conservative with a small c. Not all of us, but most of us. We think that the past was better. And in the future, things will only get worse. We battle to preserve the old ways rather than creating new ways. We think that those who went before us were, were better, stronger more visionary, more faithful. And we fear that we cannot live up to their legacy. It's an easy way of thinking to fall into, but it is not necessarily true. As Isaac Newton said, he stood on the shoulders of giants and therefore could see further. We too stand on the shoulders of giants and therefore we can see further, we can achieve more. Elisha stood on the shoulders of Elijah. The best was yet to come. Though we are constantly and inevitably parting from the past, the sorrow of parting is sweetened by the faith that the future is pregnant with promise 
and possibility. The best is yet to come. Did you notice the similarities between our, our two readings? Elijah, of course, is in both, and they both involve journeys. In both, there's a command to keep silent, to let what is happening happen in one, to let what has happened sink in in the other. In both, someone at the moment of highest drama shouts out something which really makes no sense. Elisha crying out again and again, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Peter gibbering about building shelters. Coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. Because I, as I said at the beginning, these are both stories of parting. But more than that, they are stories of succession. In 2 Kings, Elisha succeeds Elijah. In Mark, Peter, James and John are being prepared to succeed Jesus. This mystical experience shows these three disciples who Jesus really is, the ultimate fulfilment of the law and the prophecy of the Old Testament. But it also shows them who they really are, the people who would carry forward the work of the kingdom begun by Jesus. Not people who would be pale shadows of Jesus, but people who would do greater things. No wonder they had to remain silent, to let that sink in. And if these are stories of succession, which they are, then why should we ever think that the chain of succession has been broken? It hasn't. It has continued to us and will continue through us, beyond us. The work of prophecy has not ended. We still speak the word of God. We still bring the wisdom of God to bear on the life of the world. The work of the kingdom is not over. We are still working to feed the hungry, to release the oppressed, to overthrow the unjust structures of the world. In every act of kindness, every moment of compassion, every act of generosity, every prayer, every loving word, every truth bravely spoken. These are not nothing. They reveal who we really are. Disciples of Jesus and his successors in the building of the kingdom of God. Amen.
Let us pray. Shine your light into our lives, O God, and enlighten us with the radiance of Christ's love. Inspire us to shine in faith and witness as his holy disciples. Transform us into his likeness that we may live for you as he lived and love others as he loved them. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Almighty, all merciful God, lover of justice and giver of peace, Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer for all your people, for the Church of Jesus Christ, and for all who seek your face. Hear our prayer for all leaders that they will abide by your commandments especially those in whose hands lie decisions on peace or war, life or death, flourishing or destruction. Hear our prayer for the earth that you have made, longing for light but waiting in darkness trembling for redemption and recreation. Hear our prayer for those who are tormented by illness, addiction, anxiety or grief. Hear our prayer that our lives and our world may be transfigured by your glory and transformed by your love. A prayer for Racial Justice Sunday, which is marked today in churches across Britain and Ireland. Migrant God, unbound and free from borders. Your presence spans the universe. In all our travel and travail, you are the constant companion of all. In you is our eternal rest and refuge. In Jesus, who had nowhere to lay his head, you reveal yourself taking sanctuary among us. We behold you still in the face of all who are uprooted from their homes by war and weather, persecution and poverty. We bless you for their courage and resilience in seeking justice, freedom and sanctuary. Give them safety in all their trial and turmoil. Be the shelter of their lives and souls. Enfold in your peace those who have died on the way. Give to us all compassion and the capacity to listen and learn as people share their stories 
of their search and struggles for safety. Strengthen us as we work together to build communities and congregations of warm welcome, protective hospitality, and sanctuary for all. Bless us all, pilgrims together. Here we have no abiding city. Bring us where you want us to be, in the name of Christ. And now joining all our prayers with the prayers of the faithful in every place and with the prayers of the angels in heaven, we say aloud the words our Saviour Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you know, if you were listening to the intimations last week, the Kirk session met last week and much of the meeting was taken up with discussion of the process of drafting a basis of deferred union between St Nicholas Buclou and New Babylon. A working group will be formed comprising members of both Kirk sessions and it will be charged with proposing a name for the United Congregation, making a recommendation about mass provision and choosing which charity number to retain. It is envisaged that the working group will do its work during February and March. The two Kirk sessions will meet separately to vote on the draft basis, and if they agree to the proposals it contains, then the two congregations will hold meetings probably in April, at which everyone will have the opportunity to vote on the basis of deferred union. A union between St Nicholas, Buclou and New Battle would only, took place, would, would, would only take place sorry, if both Kirk sessions and both congregations vote for it. If agreed, the basis of deferred union would then go to Presbytery in early June for ratification. This is very much in line with the timeline I described for you back in December, so there should be no real surprises but nonetheless, I thought it would be as well to keep you all updated with what's been going on. I've got uh, an intimation which we don't have a slide for. I'll put a slide up next week, and that's just to give you advance notice of the World Day of Prayer service, which is taking place on Friday the 1st of March, and it will be at 7 o'clock in St Mary's Church, the Scottish Episcopal Church just down the road inside the gates of the, the country park. And this year uh, the, the service draws on uh, work provided by Christian women of Palestine, so perhaps a particularly apt and poignant um, time to be hearing from them. And the theme is, I beg you to bear with one another in love. So we'll announce that in the next couple of weeks as well, uh, but uh, that's advanced, advanced notice of that service taking place on the 1st of March. Rather sooner than that, of course, St John's and Newton Church Guild is meeting this Thursday, the 15th of February at two o'clock in the church. Sue Mackenzie and Erica Pride will tell that meeting about new ideas in Newton and everyone is, who's interested in is most welcome to attend. On the Sunday, the yes, 25th, I haven't written this down. Sunday the 25th, we're going to be holding the next in our series of joint services with our friends at New Battle. And this time, because they were here for Christmas Eve, we'll be going up the hill to Mayfield and East Houses Church. That's 11 o'clock 
on uh, the 25th. And again, I'll say that again next week. And then I think I've got a bit confused here, Thelma. What is yes, we're right, we're back on track. Uh, just a, a reminder that tea and coffee is served after the service uh, with biscuits, many as you like, through in the coffee shop. So do come through for that. Just before we sing our closing hymn, I thought I'd explain the picture which will accompany it. I generally don't favour so-called scientific explanations for apparently miraculous events in the Bible because generally the point of them is not the miracle itself but what it tells us about the person, be that Jesus or someone else, who is at the centre of the story. But if you look at the two pictures which are now on the screen, one a painting by Raphael in the Vatican Museum, and the other a photograph I took on a hill just north of Calendar, I think you'll see some similarities. The photo is of a phenomenon called a broken spectre, which occurs when a shadow is cast by the sun onto cloud. So that shadow is actually me. I was casting that shadow uh, with it has uh, rainbow-like rings around my head. Now, I'm not going to claim it as a halo. It's uh, just a way that the light is refracted. I find it intriguing to think that this phenomenon may be the origin of some of the details of the story of the Transfiguration. But that in no way detracts from that story's spiritual significance. Anyway, our final hymn reminds us of the real meaning of this story, that it opened a glimpse of heaven and in doing so changed the lives of the disciples who witnessed it. So we sing our closing hymn, number 353, Bright the Cloud and Bright the Glory.
the Lord shine upon you. May hope fill you. May the word of the Lord live within you. And the Spirit of the Lord give you peace. And the blessing of God, Creator, Christ and Holy Spirit, rest upon you all this day and forevermore.